son of God, 100% divinity. Yeah, self existent second person of the Trinity. Magisterial, imperial at the helm. Infinitely transcending this material realm. Yeah. Hello there, YouTube. Ethan Smith here. Does let us make man in our image in Genesis 126 demonstrate the Trinity, imply the Trinity, prove the Trinity, or a Trinitarian just taking it too far? How did the early church view that verse? How did they interpret it? Let's see the evidence. Genesis 1, 26-27 says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Here we see God use the plural pronoun us, but also singular pronouns and verbs. Now whether we are Trinitarians or not, we should admit that the us is ambiguous in the context. The us is not explicitly identified or described in the immediate context whether we like it or not. Different explanations have been offered, including, number one, God was speaking to the angels or his angelic host, his uh, heavenly court. Number two, God was speaking to wisdom. Number three, God was speaking with a plurality of majesty or emphasis like a king. Number four, the us is the trinity speaking within the complexity of his being. And number five, the father was speaking to his son and or his Holy Spirit. And I'm sure there are other uh, uh, explanations as well. Now, which is the best and most biblical interpretation? Since Genesis chapter 1 is unclear, it is best to take the Bible as a whole in order to decide the most likely interpretation, and looking at how the early generations after the apostles interpreted it is also very beneficial. Let's see. An early epistle credited to Barnabas, writing around 100 AD or so, close to John's death, interpreted it as God speaking to the Son. Irenaeus is regarded as the disciple of Polycarp, who was the disciple of John. He was an influential apologist in his time. He interpreted Genesis 1.26 as the Father speaking to the Son and the Spirit, who were always present with him. This is clearly one God and three persons very early in church history. Tertullian, another early church apologist, writing against Praxis, a modalist, interpreted basically identical to Irenaeus three divine persons involved in creating man. Origen, regarded as a prominent scholar and theologian of his time, writing before 254 AD, interpreted it as the Father speaking to the Son of God. Novation believed the same and even saw the Father and the Son in Genesis 19.24 where it says, Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Again, we see early church testimony to the teaching that Jehovah is more than one person. Genesis 19.24 is obviously only about Jehovah God himself. Also note Athanasius, writing around 318 AD. He said, Someone called the Word was with God when he made all things, through him and unto him. The Savior is distinguished from God the Father in this context. Looking at the Father, he fashioned the universe. The interpretation that the Father was speaking to his Son and or Spirit in Genesis 1.26 is well attested in the early church, and I don't know of any early father contradicting this or saying it's wrong. More importantly than the historical witness, are we able to give good reasons from Scripture that Genesis 1.26 supports the plurality within the unity of God, threeness in oneness? First of all, in the very same chapter, we see the Holy Spirit active and moving in the Genesis creation. If the Spirit of God was involved in God creating the heavens and the earth, verse 1, it should be no surprise if God was speaking at least to him in verse 26. The Holy Spirit is described as the Creator in other portions of Scripture too. Thou sendest forth thy Spirit, they are created. The Spirit of God hath made me. And in Hebrews 1.10, God the Father explicitly says to the Son, Thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. Clearly referring back to the Genesis creation. 
The Father describes the Son as Lord and the Creator of the heavens and the earth. He must be a co-equal, co-eternal divine person. Verse 2 also describes the Son as through whom God made the worlds. Colossians 1, 13-17 describes the dear Son, verse 13, as by whom, through whom, and for whom all things were created. John chapter 1 also mentions the one who was already in the beginning and with God as the creator of absolutely everything. This person called the Logos is explicitly identified as the one and only from the Father, verse 14, Jesus Christ, verse 17, and the one and only Son who is himself God, verse 18. And lastly, 1 Corinthians 8, 6 describes both the Father and the Son as involved in the creation of all things. It is from the Father and through the Son all things came into existence. These different roles necessitate co-eternal persons. If the Father alone created everything, it should say from the Father and through the Father, but it doesn't. It clearly shows the Son distinct from the Father as involved in the creation. So here we see all the New Testament evidence that Genesis 1.26 would refer to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as one God and being involved in the creation of mankind in the image of God. These verses give us the possibility that the New Testament writers saw Genesis 1.26 in a similar way to those early church fathers. What about God speaking to the angels and saying, Let us make man in our image? Well, I used to personally believe in this interpretation until I recognized there is no Bible verse which states we are, were made in the image of angels or that angels helped God in creating humanity or sustaining humanity. The creation of humanity is exclusive to Jehovah Almighty, Isaiah 44:24. He alone is our spiritual father or potter and he alone gets the credit in creating mankind. I do not believe we were created in the image of angels or by angels. God alone created us in his image. And God doesn't need the permission from angels to create us. If non-Trinitarians interpret Isaiah 44:24 as one divine person, the Father, speaking, and yet interpret Genesis 1:26 as him speaking to the angels, there seems to be a strong contradiction here. He wouldn't be alone in creation after all. Interestingly, Scripture never states that God made angels in his image either. There is no evidence in Genesis 1 that God was speaking to the angels. One must simply assume this interpretation. We were not made in the image of wisdom either. Why on earth would any professing Christian want to go with the interpretation of unbelieving Jews who reject Jesus rather than the earliest Christian interpretation found in the pre-Nicene Fathers? I don't see any good or biblical reasons to interpret Genesis 1.26 as God speaking to his heavenly court. It is honoring to God to affirm that Jehovah alone created mankind with no help. God in his infinite wisdom inspired the scriptures to say, Let us, not let me, make man in my image. Knowing fully well multitudes of his people in the future who love Jesus would see this as indicating the Trinity. Why would he put this in the first page of the Bible, knowing this in advance, if there is no trinity? He didn't need to put it in the Bible, but he did for a reason. It seems non-Trinitarians have to come up with all sorts of theories on Genesis 1.26 to avoid the trinity at all costs. Conclusion we see evidence from early church leaders or apologists of the most common Trinitarian interpretation of Genesis 1.26. The Epistle of Barnabas, Irenaeus, Tertullian, Origen, Novation, and Athanasius all interpret it as God speaking to his Son and or Holy Spirit. We also see biblical evidence for this early interpretation. The Son and the Holy Spirit are explicitly described as involved in creation. Therefore, Genesis 1.26 does support or imply the triunity of the one Lord God of Israel. May you treasure him with all your heart. And every day we taste of a grace that we're unconcerned with My sin I should be burned with I'm guilty, filthy, and stained But he became a curse, drank my cup and took my pain Yeah.